Today I'm going to cover some preflop concepts, particularly I'm going to cover just, I'm going to go over position really quickly and then I'm going to talk about raising a little bit. Um, and then what I'm going to talk about tomorrow uh, is going to be some post-flop decisions, particularly that have to do with, you know, how do you play these boards that have a lot of texture on them? And by texture, what I mean is cards that are highly related to each other, right? So there's a big difference between a board that's like ace-9-3 with no suits versus a board that's like jack-10-6 with two spades, right? Because those cards really relate to each other. I'm going to talk about that situation. I bet those are situations that a lot of you have a lot of difficulty with. They're very complex situations to deal with. So we're going to, we're going to talk about preflop today and then postflop tomorrow. So before I ever talk any poker at all to anybody, I always like to define the problem because I think that one of the things that you'll, you'll see in the book if you get it is that people don't really think about what their purpose is at the table enough. So people come in, they're like, oh, I want to win money or something like that. Um, but in order to set your pur purpose properly, you have to understand what the problem that the game of poker presents is. And it's this problem at the top. It's a game of decision making under conditions of uncertainty. What that means is that you have multiple decision points in a hand, right? It's not like craps, right? In craps you have one decision, like pass or don't pass, you know, or I guess you could play the hops, but I wouldn't re recommend it. But anyway, um, and that's it, right? And then a bunch of stuff happens and you're done. So, so it's just one decision at the beginning of, of the roll. Um, here, you have multiple decisions that you can make. Like in a game of poker in Nevada where there's four, um, four raises and a bet, there's a possible five decision points on each round of betting and there's four possible rounds of betting, so there's 20 places where you might have to make a decision during a hand. That's the, that's the highest number that you'd have to make. And you have to make that under conditions of uncertainty, meaning that you can't see your opponent's whole cards, right? So in a game of chess, I can see my opponent's whole position. So the game of chess is about iteration, right? It's about how many levels deep can I get into the thinking process here? Like, how I'm going to think of all your possible responses, and then I'm going to figure out all my possible responses to that, and then maybe I'll figure out all your possible responses to my possible responses, and so on and so forth. And really what makes somebody a better chess player is how far into that process that can they go. And so because there's no hidden information, chess is actually a solvable game. When we have enough computing power, that game will be solved, and a human being will never beat a computer. Um, and we know that because computers have already solved checkers, which is a more simplified version of chess. But poker isn't that way. I can't see your whole cards, okay? So when I'm defining what you have, I'm doing this under conditions of uncertainty that isn't the same in a game like chess. And in fact, if you were to talk to a game theorist, they would tell you that chess wasn't a game. It's actually a calculation. It's a mathematical exercise, whereas poker is a game because games require that there's hidden information and interaction among players over time, okay? So once we understand what the problem is, then we can come up with our real purpose at the table. And it's not to win money, it's to reduce uncertainty. Because if you reduce uncertainty, if you put yourself in a position where things are more clear to you than your opponents, then you can force your opponents to make bad decisions and you'll be making good decisions and guess what, you're gonna win. And it turns out that in poker the score is money. Right, so you're just going for a good score. But the way you get to a good score is this, because frankly, I could be playing for matchsticks or pride or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Like, if, if I'm playing with my family, I might be playing for pride, right? No money involved. If I'm playing in prison, maybe I'm playing for, you know, credits, I don't know, cigarettes or something. Hopefully I'm not in prison. Um, okay, so um, I already went through this, right? So what we're gonna go through today in, in thinking about this is, uh, position as it relates to that problem, and then raising it as it relates to this problem that we've defined. And then this is the same thing. When we talk about playing monsters on these flops that are textured, it's a decision problem about uncertainty. So everything's going to be framed in that language. On the slide, I've notated, the, uh, or Andrew has, he was nice to do this, uh, the page that the discussion is on in the book so that you have some easy, easy reference. Um, okay, so here's the deal. We know that in this game, because of the problem, information is going to be power, right? The more information we have, the better decision maker we're going to be. Well, it turns out that position equals information, right? Because when you're under the gun, everybody knows what under the gun means? Awesome. Okay. When, my book has a great glossary, though, in case you don't know. Um, under, when you're under the gun, when you're in first position at the poker table, you are going to be acting with the least amount of information before the flock, right? So you have to make a decision before anybody else has done anything. That's no small problem, I want to add, okay? When you're on the button, you're in the opposite situation, right? When you're on the button, 
you're going to act with the most information. You're going to see what everybody does before you ever have to make a decision. Now, hold them is a game where position is constant, right, throughout the hand. It doesn't change. So you know that when you choose to enter a pot in first position, you're not just choosing to make a, a decision that's going to be hard right then, but you're choosing to make a decision that's going to be hard for the rest of the hand. Because anytime anybody calls, you know, one of those people who's sitting to your left calls, you're going to have to act before them for the rest of the hand. So this is a problem you're choosing to carry out through the rest of the hand. When you're on the button, you're in the opposite situation. You know that for the rest of the hand, you're always going to get to see what everybody does before you ever have to make a decision. That's a pretty huge difference. To give you an idea of how huge a difference it is, um, I like to refer to my small children. Um, and, you know, you, you, have you ever seen these kids do this? You know, like you have two little girls, and one of them says, uh, do you like Justin Bieber? And the other one always says the same thing, I don't know, do you? They don't ever answer, right? They always say, I don't know, do you? And then the, the first one says, I asked you first. So what are, they're having a positional battle, right? Like, you've got to think about that. They're having a battle over position. Who has to give the first answer here, right? And the reason why is that they understand that it's kind of a disaster to go first. Because now we're talking about social currency, right? If they like Justin Bieber and the other one doesn't, mm. And if they don't like Justin Bieber and the other one does, mm. <laughs> right? So they've got to figure out what the right answer is because randomly they're only going to get the right answer half the time and they're trying to up their, the probability that they're correct. So they want to get the other person to answer first. Poker players are surprisingly less smart than seven-year-olds. <laughs> right? Because, like, here's the thing. How many of you had heard this? Oh, under the gun is the new button. No, it's not. <laughs> On the button, I get to act last. How is that the new button? What are you talking about? Okay, so when people frame this, this uh, positional problem, um, okay, we're not going to go there. When people frame this positional problem, they're always saying, oh, you know, they put up these hand charts, these silly hand charts. I don't even know what those are for because I have no idea what game you're playing in. Because honestly, the hand chart will be different if you're in a one and two game with a bunch of drunk people, you know, versus, uh, you know, in the final day of the World Series of Poker. I can guarantee you I have to give you a different chart for that. Um, so I don't understand hand charts, but, but anyway, when you've seen those in books, because every book that you've ever read has a hand chart, right? Except mine, by the way. Mine doesn't. But uh, cause I don't, they don't make sense to me. So, but when you see those hand charts, they're always talking about, oh, you should play these hands in early position because there's X probability that there's a better hand behind you. Okay, seriously, how many of you guys play hands where you know for a fact the other person has a better hand? Do any of you do that? I guarantee you all do. I'm going to prove it to you right now. You have nine, seven of hearts, and the board comes king of hearts, three of hearts, ten of spades. How many of you are calling on the flop? All of you, right? Do you have the best hand right now? Okay? And you don't care, right? Okay. So we don't care about whether we have the best hand. That's actually a decision that comes up very rarely in poker, believe it or not. In a game of hold'em, now, in a game of, like, kitchen sink or something, it comes up a lot. Do you, kitchen sink, like, you have five cards, five on the board, any come, anyway. Then it really matters if you have the best hand. But in a game like hold'em, it's rarely part of your decision about whether you have the best hand. So it's, this isn't an issue about whether you have the best hand. So the charts are really leading you astray here. The issue is, if somebody comes in behind me, what is my decision going to look like? Because if I'm in position on them, I can win without the best hand. Because I'm going to know what they're going to do, and I'm going to see that they're weak and all of that stuff. But if I come in in first position, I'm not going to know any of that. So I'm going to have very little information. So what causes you to play tighter in first position is that if you come in in first position, you have to, hand that, have, to have a hand that knows about itself. Because the other players are not going to tell you anything about your hand. So do you see, it's a different way of thinking about it. So what I mean by that is that if I have a hand like King Jack, it's very important for you guys to tell me something about your hand, right? Because right? King Jack is a very kind of uh, marginal holding. I don't know if it's good or not, so I'd like to see whether you're weak and all that stuff before me. But if I have aces, do I have to know anything about your hand? I just know I have the best hand. So there are hands that contain clarity in and of themselves. And those are the hands you play in first position, usually. Hands like ace-king, ace-queen. Hands like sevens, eights, nines, tens, jacks, queens, kings, aces. I'm done, by the way. Okay, so, and the reason why you don't play hands like ace-jack is this clarity issue. I don't really know if, a, I don't know much about ace-jack. I'm not sure if it's good, and here's the problem. If I improve and I flop a jack, now I really don't know what I have. The board comes king-jack three. I've got three people behind me. How am I feeling? So don't play hands where when you improve, the problem gets worse, right? Play hands where when you improve, the problem gets better. If I have two sevens and I improve, what do I have? 
Awesome. Do I know what I have? My hand knows what it is now, right? So I can be in first position with that hand. I don't care what anybody does behind me. I have the best hand. Great. Now, there's another problem being in first position. Is it easy to bluff from first position? No. OK, that's bad, right? So how, is it easy to bluff from the button? OK, so that's a good reason. You can play hands that are more likely going to end up as bluffs on the button then. You know what hands more likely end up as bluffs? Bad ones. <laughs> no, this is important. The worse the hand you play, the more likely you're going to have to bluff, right? People don't connect that up in starting cards. It's very connected in my book, but this is something we think about with starting hands. H how's my bluffing frequency going to look for the rest of the hand? If I choose to play a crappy hand, my bluffing frequency is going to be higher than if I choose to play a better hand. So if I'm going to play a crappy hand, I should be in a spot where bluffing is going to work. And that's not first position. Now, but you might be saying to yourself, oh, I'm not worried about that, though. I want to get the guy when I flop a good hand. How easy it is if you have a set to get money out of your opponent when you have to go first? It's not very easy, right? So it's a twofold problem. You get both sides of the sword there, right? I can't bluff, and if I do make a hand, I can't get any money out of you. So I would suggest not playing a lot of hands from first position unless you know exactly what they are. Because I wouldn't play these speculative hands from there, because if you speculate and you hit, it's not like you can cash them anyway. And if you speculate and don't hit, you can't win the pot. OK? So stop doing that. <laughs> All right. So listen, we've decided what kind of hands we're going to play from first position, right? And they're really good ones. <laughs> Now, obviously, if you're in a game where bluffing is very effective, you can loosen up a little bit from first position. If you're in a game where bluffing isn't working for you very well, you'd probably tighten up from all positions at the table. So that's just you to decide what kind of game you're in. So I'm not going to tell you, oh, never play ace-jack in first position, because you've got to decide whether you've got a tight game on your hands. Tighter the game, the more hands you can play. The looser the game, the fewer you can play for this reason. All right. So we've now decided, OK, I'm going to come into the pot, and we have a choice about whether we're going to raise or we're going to call. Now, I am not going to tell you, like many books do, that in the game of No Limit Hold'em, when you're going in and playing a tournament, if you're first into the pot, you should raise. I think that's absurd, right? Because I don't know what game you're in. It will work about 80% of the time, you know, which works only 80% of the time. That's the problem. So it would be like if I told you uh, I before E. And then you came to me and you said, I just got a, you know, F on my spelling test because I couldn't spell neighbor. And I went, oh, yeah, because I, I didn't tell you the except after C part and except when it's A, like in neighbor and way, and then there's weird, right? Because <laughs> I only told you the rule that worked most of the time, I before E. And now, but now you're screwed. Yeah, but, but, that, but the problem is that mo most people, when they give you a rule, as opposed to teaching you how to think for yourself, they're giving you a rule that's going to work 80% of the time because that author is telling you something that has worked for them generally. You know what? You're not me. People don't react to you the way, same way that they react to me. So I would be doing you a huge disservice if I gave you rules. I don't use rules myself anyway. So instead, I'm going to, te I'm going to give you ways to think. So what we're going to do is figure out, well, what's the value of raising? Because if we understand the value of raising, we should be able to understand where it's appropriate to raise and where it's not appropriate to raise, right? So value one of raising is to gain information. Now, that shouldn't surprise you. What's the problem in poker? Lack of information. So one would hope that the most important thing that raising did for you was to get you information. So let's talk about gain information first, right? OK, I decide to limp in from first position. You check in the big blind. How much do I know about your hand that I didn't know before I chose to put chips into the pot? They probably don't have aces. I mean, but could they have seven deuce offsuit? <clears throat> OK, so have I used my chips to any great purpose there? I use my chips to get lucky, I guess. It's not a game of luck, so that's bad, right? So I haven't used my chips to any purpose there, OK? Now, it gets worse. I limp in, and a guy to my left limps in behind me. What do I know about his hand? Not too much, right? Probably doesn't have seven deuce offsuit, but could he have six five? Sure. Okay, that's pretty bad. If I'm letting, if I've ranged a guy all the way down to six five, I'm in big trouble, right? And he's on my left. So does he have an advantage on me? Right, so that's pretty bad. Okay, now limping encourages limping, right? So now he limps in and somebody else limps in behind me. Do I know more or less about the second limper? Less, because the pot's getting bigger, which is encouraging people to play. So I'm allowing people to come into my left, getting a cascade of degrading information here, right? Now it gets even worse. I, 
you know, I'm like Ginsu knife. Like, that can slice the tomato, paper thin. Okay, so I limp in. The guy to my left limps in, and now the next guy raises. You know, your chips are a way to have a conversation with someone, right? That guy just yelled. Okay, you would assume that would mean something, but do we know anything about that razor's hand? Does it have to be good? Why did someone raise their hand? Why does it have to be good? Because it, well, a, yeah, so it could be, he could be taking advantage of the weakness that's sitting in front of him, right? You, think about the conversation you just had. You limped in and you said, I have a hand I don't like very much, okay? In fact, I know probably what that hand is. It's probably suited connectors or a middle pair, or a small pair, rather. Am I right, by the way, all of you guys? Because I know you do this, right? I'm right, right? You, so that's bad right away, because this is a game of hidden information. Why are you telling me so much? Think about it, right? You just told me what you had, and you only put in two chips into the pot. How'd that happen? For you to tell me what you had, I should have made you commit a lot of chips to get you to tell me anything, right? But you just did it with two chips. You have pseudo connectors or a middle pair. Okay, great. So I know that. So I know you're weak. I know you're vulnerable, right? Now the next guy limps in. I say, well, oh my gosh, well, he didn't raise him, so he must also be really weak, because otherwise he would have raised him. So I go, these two jokers have nothing. I don't even need to look at my cards. I get to raise there. I could have two napkins. And you know what? It's not their fault. It's your fault. That's your fault for behaving that way. So now you're facing a raise, and you don't know anything about that guy's hand, and he's on your left, all because you didn't ask him a question. Because limping is not asking anybody a question, or not a significant one. So let's now change this. And now, this is much more fleshed out in the book. I want to let you know I talk about like how you deal with two sevens in that spot, because that's normally what you have, and why that situation is so bad. It's very long section of the book. Okay, I don't have time for it here, so uh, you'll have to get that from there. But let me tell you now the reverse situation where you actually ask an appropriate question. I open the pot for a raise now. The big blind calls me. What do I know about their hand? For whatever their decent is. Right? It's, he's got something. Whatever. So, and you know, like there's some players where that something might be the top 20% of their range. There's some players where it might be the top 50% of their range. You know your players better than me. But they've now told you they don't have seven deuce offsuit. They've told you that the bottom part of their range is not what they're holding. Correct? That's really valuable information for you. Now think about this. This is where it gets really cool. I open the pot in first position, and the guy to my, directly to my left, sitting in second position, flat calls me. What does he have? Now I ask him a really good question, by the way. What does he have? Does he like his hand? Does he like his hand a lot? Now this is interesting, right? So you all think he likes his hand, but you don't think he likes it a lot. So tell me, so, so if he doesn't like it a lot, you're saying he doesn't have aces, right? Why doesn't he have aces? Someone raise their hand. Why doesn't he have aces? He would have raised, right? Because with all those people behind him, he's not going to flat aces from the two spot. He might flat from the button, right? Because he's got position, but certainly not from the two spot. Good. Does he have kings? No. Does he have ace-king? Almost, uh, almost definitely not, right? Most players probably don't have queens. Some do, some don't. That's going to be up to you. But here's the deal. You know he doesn't have aces, kings, or ace, king, un unless there's something really weird going on. So normally he's not going to have aces, kings, or ace, king. But he also doesn't have, like, jack eight, right? So we know he likes his hand, so he's got a good range, but not the very best range. Think how strong that is for you if you have queens and the board comes ten high. I'm not really worried about aces or kings now, right? I think I've probably got boss pair. The only thing I'm concerned about is maybe he has tens. But I just threw out a lot of the things that I'm worried about because I asked an appropriate question of him before the flop, right? Now, think how powerful that is in terms of what that guy's just told you. That's huge. Now, what if I raise, and now the guy in the two hole re-raises me? Now, remember, before, if I limp in and he raises me, I haven't learned anything. I have no idea what to do. But, you know, like if I have two sevens. But now, I, I raise in first position, and now the guy in the two hole re-raises, and let's assume that we're, you know, at 30 big blinds, so there isn't a huge gain to be made here by the call. Now what can I do with my two sevens pretty easily? I can muck them, right? Because now I know he's got the top of his range, because he's not, he's not re-raised bluffing from that spot. 
right? So look how much easier my decisions just got because I asked the appropriate questions with my chips. Your chips are a way to have a conversation. So that's number one is gain information. Okay. Now, okay. Number two is narrow the field. Okay. So by narrowing the field, what we mean is that we would like to get down to one player. And if we don't raise, we aren't asking anybody to be selective about their hands, which means we're not asking anybody to fold. In fact, we're encouraging them to call, right? So what we really want to do, though, in almost every hand of hold'em, and actually in every hand of hold'em, is get down to one opponent, max. So we're going to have to do that with raising. Now, there's a legend in poker right now that uh, suited cards play great in multi-way pots. How many of you think that? Come on, you can admit it. It's all right. It looks like AA. <laughs> okay, because none of you want to admit it. Let's ask this. How many of you have read a book that told you that suited cards play well in multi-way pots? Okay, great. How many of you... It's okay. Raise your hands. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Like, you wouldn't be here if you already knew this. Okay. How many of you have friends... <laughs> How many of you have friends who are always like, oh, I love pseudo connectors. I love limping in with pseudo connectors. They're so awesome because I make so much money. And how many of you have those friends? <laughs> Go ahead. No, it's all right. Raise your hand. Like, because 100% of your hands should have gone up. I have friends like that. Come on. Well, right. It's the same ones who are like, I drive better when I'm drunk. Okay. So here's the deal. I have made it my life's mission in poker. Like, I really have. People who know me know that this is, like, my life's mission. To get people to understand when suited cards are appropriate and when they're not. So I'm going to prove to you right now that suited, these kind of suited connectors are really awesome against one player. But they're not really awesome against multiple players. I bet that's going against what you thought before you walked in the room. Yeah? I mean, you, not you. You already read the book. I saw it because you had highlights and read and all. Like, you really read the book, which I love. Okay. So, but that, I'm going to convince you of that. So can we make a deal... I just want to make a deal. It's like, you know, a pact. That if I can convince you of this one thing, that you'll stop playing these little suited connectors in first position. Because you know you do it, right? You guys all look down at 6-7 suited in first position. You're like, oh, it's so pretty. <laughs> you see, you're laughing because it's you. You do it, right? Okay, but here's the thing. I got a question for you because I get it. I get it. I get it. If you look down at 6-7 off suit, do you feel the same way? No, you're like, ah, piece of crap. <laughs> okay, I want to, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that you make almost all the same hands with 6-7 suited as you do with 6-7 off suit. So that's the first clue. So let's go through the things you make with 6-7 that don't involve a flush, because this is for both of them. Because I'm going to prove to you that suitedness is a horrible little, it's like, you it's seductress, it's awful. Okay, so... So, because here's the thing, you should say, okay, if this hand weren't suited, would I play it? And if the answer is no, don't. But I know it's hard, because they're, like, really beautiful, right? Like, this is, this, you frame them, put in a picture frame. Okay, so we're going to, um, here we go, we're going to talk about this suited stuff. Okay, let's talk, what's the most likely thing you make when you have, like, a 6-7 suited? What's the most likely thing you're going to flop? Raise, someone raise their hand, quick. What? No! What's the most likely thing you're going to flop? Nothing! Nothing. Like 70% of the time. Nothing. Okay, here's my question for you. If you flop 70, you know, 70% of the time, you flop nothing, would you rather be against one opponent or four? One. That's a really good clue right now. Okay, we, we started to break the veil, right? Pierce the veil. That's what's okay, great. What's the second most likely thing that you'll make with six, seven? One pair. Okay, the board's ace, ten, seven. Because, <laughs> by the way, you don't make top pair with that. <laughs> and you've either got a seven kicker or a six kicker. Okay, would you rather be against one player or many? One, right? Because just like with the nothing, with nothing you can still win against one player. You can't win with nothing against many. And with one pair, A, you might have the best hand, and who cares? Because you can pretend like you're bluffing anyway and win the pot, and you'll never do that against many. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. What if you flop two pair with 6-7? Would you rather be against one player or many? Why would you rather be against one player? Because of the draws. 
and because of the overcards that might make two pair against your four opponents. So here's the problem. When you're playing suited connectors, by definition, when you flop two pair, there's a straight draw on the board. By definition. So if the board comes ace, six, seven, as an example, because when you flop two pair with six, seven, again, it's not like it's top two pair or anything. And if it is, by the way, someone has, now there's a real straight draw. So now the board's six, seven, five. Good luck with that. Okay, so the board comes ace, six, seven, which is actually the best way to flop two pair there. Okay, are you happy if an eight hits? No, great. Are you happy if a nine hits? No. Are you happy if a 10 hits? You're doubly unhappy because someone might have ace 10, right? Okay, great. So right now we're at um, uh, 12 cards. Okay, so are you happy if a uh, five hits? No, great, no. Okay, are you happy if a four hits? No, you're against four opponents, by the way. You think so? I mean, the god in there would crap, right? I mean, it's not like they're all, right. So you're worried about ace, ace, uh, eight, five, okay. Okay, are you happy if a three hits? You think someone doesn't have five, four suited? You all play that hand, give me a break. Okay. Great. So you're unhappy with a three. Now, are you happy with a king, queen, or jack? No, because those, those are cards that go with ace, right? Okay. And against four people, you're like, oh, holy shit, right? Okay, great. So that, that we're at eight right now. Okay. Um, so, so here we go. Eight, what's eight times four? Quick. 32 cards. Ooh, that's really bad. Yeah. Okay. Now, wait. You're kind of, so here's the deal. You're kind of unhappy with a deuce because someone had ace deuce, but I'm even going to give credit for the deuces. So here, my argument has 32 cards going for it, okay? You guys are happy. Oh, and an ace is really bad. I'm sorry. I have 30, I have, oh my God, I have 35 cards. Jeez, no, because there's an ace on the board. There's only okay, so I have 35 cards for my argument because an ace is like the worst, right? Ah, now two jacks beat you. Ugh. Okay, so I have 35 cards going for me. You guys have... Two se the two sevens, the two sixes, and I'm giving you credit for the deuces. Okay. So you, have, you guys have eight. I have 35 and you have eight. Who wins? Unless, unless it's Donald Trump choosing. Who wins? Eight. Okay. Good. I win. Okay, great. Okay. He's like, Annie, I know you have 35 and she has eight, but she's old. She wins. Okay. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, even if you flop two pair, would you rather be against one player or many? One, because your hand's going to stay good. <laughs> okay, good. So, all right, but you guys are all like, I know what you're thinking. Oh, I want to make a flush. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, 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 I want to make a flush. Great. So, uh, can we make it, if I can prove to you that you'd rather have a flush against one player, then, I, then we're done, right? Great. Okay, so you have like six, seven suited of spades, let's say, and the board comes king, ten, three, three spades. 118 to one. Ba -doom boom. Okay, less than 1% of the time, you flopped your flush. You're against four players. Can you check? No, right? Because you have seven high. Okay, good. So you can't check because if any other spade comes off, you're just... Right, you, you just can't do that. So you have to bet. That's for, number one, you flopped your dream hand and you don't have options. That's, that's a sign that something's wrong here. Okay, so you bet and now a guy calls you. Are you, even, are you happy that he called? Now a guy moves in on you. How do you guys feel? Okay, now here's the interesting thing about that. You guys... Everything that you've heard about this is implied odds, right? They're like, oh, I love to play suited connectors because even though I'm clearly a complete idiot before the flop, after the flop, someone's going to give me their whole stack. Now, okay, and that works sometimes. By the way, there are places where that concept absolutely applies, but not here. Because in order for implied odds to make sense, then you have to be happy when someone puts their whole stack in the pot, correct? Is that fair? I mean, I'm just using logic. It's not like I'm Plato over here or something. I mean... It's pretty simple, like, right, okay. So in order for you to be thinking about implied odds, you must be happy that someone has put their whole stack into the pot. Okay, someone just put their whole stack into the pot, and I assume you're looking for a bucket, yes? <laughs> and here's why, because you have seven high, so you don't know what your hand is. Remember, going back to that idea of uncertainty, this hand doesn't know what it is. Is it the best hand or not? You don't know. So you call and then you're knocked out of the tournament and you, this is what happens. You come up to me and you go, oh, I was so unlucky. I got to tell you about this hand I played, Annie. I'm like, okay. 
Um, I'm going to go into this with the mistaken impression you're trying to learn something. Okay, so you say to me, ah, I had six, seven suited, and I flopped a flush, and you know, this guy moved in on me, and I called, and he beat me. I'm like, oh, okay, wait, how'd you get involved with six, seven suited? No, that's not the point of my story. The point of my story is I flopped a flush, and someone beat me, or they sucked out on me. I'm like, wait, wait, no, but I want to know, like, where, where, how'd you have the six, seven suited? Like, were you in first position? No, but you're missing the point of my I'm like, no, I'm really not missing the point of the story, but whatever, okay, bad luck, have a nice day. Look, you caused that to happen to yourself because you chose to play a hand that when you made it, you wouldn't know what it was. Now, you say to yourself, wait, wait, but you never flop a flush, and actually, it's much better if I flop a flush draw. You know you feel that way, right? So if the board comes king, ten, three, three spades, and you have six, seven of spades, you feel less comfortable than if the board comes king, ten, three with only two spades. Is that right? Think about it. Right? When you look at that king, ten, three with two spades, you're, you, you don't have the same kind of anxiety about your hand, do you? That's weird, right? Because if you have a six of spades, which, do you like, which flop do you like better? You like the king, ten, three, all spades flop, right? So this is a really weird thing. Why is it that if you have ace high, you'd rather have three spades come down, but if you have seven high, you're, you're really feeling more comfortable in your skin if two spades come down? And I can tell you why. Because in the second case, you know what you have. If the board comes king, ten, three, two spades, you know you don't have anything. And that's why you're more comfortable with the hand. Because in the first case, you have no idea what you have. You don't know if you have the best hand. And here's the weird thing. When you bet in that spot, you're actually more comfortable if everybody folds on the king, ten, three, three spades board. I just showed you that. Because when you get called, it causes you all sorts of anxiety. Do you know what the definition of a bluff is? When you bet and you want people to fold. So that's weird. You flopped a flush and you're actually bluffing. By definition. Okay, so now it comes king, ten, three, two spades, and you're feeling much more comfortable in your life. It should tell you that there's something wrong, right? And, and, and here's the weird thing, right? So now you're an eight to one dog to have that flop come, but you don't have anything yet. You still gotta make it. You're only gonna see one card. That's a four to one dog, right? So you're in this situation where it's like nine times five is 45, so you're 44 to one dog. Um, you know, to ever get to the turn and make your flush, but here's the problem in traffic, right? So you've got four players. I assume there was some sort of betting on the flop. Can everybody see two spades on the board? So when the third spade comes, can everybody see that? Okay, and we're all hyper aware of that kind of texture, right? Every, there's nobody who's not noticing that the spade hit, right? Everybody's thinking about that. So now you have to bet, because you know you have to bet, right? And it goes, call, move in, and it's not like they can, what do they have? They called on the flop, and then now they've just moved in. I mean, you're just dead. I mean, it's horrible. You're probably going to call, but bye, you're, you're walking out the door as you do. Okay, so, and now here's the really interesting thing, is that, so, so you're really unhappy when people deliver your, their stack to you, but also, it's very unlikely when we think about implied odds, we've got to think about a worse hand paying us off. And here's the problem. In multi-way pots, people are hyper aware of texture, right? So let's say that you're against someone who has, like, king-queen, and the board comes king, ten, three, three spades, and they've got king-queen of hearts. Are you getting a lot of money out of that guy? No, because he's, so he has, you have, he has king, queen of hearts, and the board comes king, ten, three, two spades, right? And so he makes the one bet on the flop, and now the spade hits. Are you getting his whole stack? No, like, what are you getting someone's whole stack with there? They cannot, stop, uh, okay. But here's the interesting thing. If you're in a heads-up pot, and you flop a flush, how do you feel? Pretty good. Will king, queen pay you off? Sure, like, what do you think? That guy's going to be like, oh, he definitely has a flop. It's one guy. So, of course, he's going to pay you off with top pair. He's going to pay you off with two pair. He's gonna... So, guess what? Implied odds works if you're against one player. Right? So, if you flop nothing, you'd rather be against one player. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't believe me yet? Cause you can raise your hand. I mean, we'll talk about it. But, okay, you're against, you, you flop no pair, you'd rather be against one guy. You flop one pair, you'd rather be against one guy. You flop two pair, you'd rather be against one guy. You flop a flush, you'd rather be against one guy. You flop a flush draw and then make your flush, you'd definitely rather be against the one guy because you don't have to make the flush, right? So when you flop a flush against one guy, you can still win. I mean, a flop, when you flop a flush draw against one guy, you can still win even if you don't make it. You can't still win even if you don't make it against multiple guys. And when you do make the flush, you'd rather be against one guy because you're more likely to get paid off as opposed to paying off someone else with a better hand. 
So suited connectors would rather be against one player. So I'm not telling you not to play it. I'm telling you if you're going to play it, please be the raiser and please make sure you can get down to one opponent. Then play away. I don't care. Have a field day with them. No hands bad. I mean, there's, you know, there's appropriate times to play seven deuce soft suit. I don't really care. Just make sure it's the right time. So, um, so are we like clear on that? Okay. All right. Take the lead. It's the last reason to raise. Okay. Does everybody know what the lead is? Yeah? The power of position in the hand, right? So why is the lead m so incredibly important? The reason why the lead is so incredibly important is that Hold'em is not a game of the battle over two people who've made a hand. Hold'em is a game of a battle over two people who haven't made a hand and who gets to win. So, how many of you have ever heard this at a poker table? I checked to the razor in your life. See, none of you are hand raisers, but I know that every, you hear that every day. I like it when people raise their hands, though. Like we're in school, see? There we go. Okay, so we've all heard that, I checked to the razor. And that's just a verbal statement of the lead. I checked to the guy with the lead. That's what that person is saying. Okay, so let me give you an example of why the lead is so important. I'm not sure if it's on the next slide. Let me see. Nope. Okay. So uh, here's why the lead is so important. Very common scenario, okay? Because you haven't come to this seminar yet. You limp in with ace jack suited, right? So, well, you haven't come. You know, I forgive you. Okay. So you limp in with ace jack suited, okay? And now the guy with two fives raises you. That makes sense, right? And now you call, right? So he's got two fives. You've got ace jack suited. Who has the lead? The fives. Great. Okay. So so your suitedness is in spades, okay? So you've got ace, jack of spades, the other guy has two fives, he's got the lead, the board comes king of hearts, nine of hearts, six of diamonds. You check to the razor, right? The razor bets and you fold. Okay. Now, that's actually the mathematically correct result. So I, my, my book's not math heavy because math doesn't matter that much, but it, it's, it's in, it's a, the math that matters is in there. But anyway, so, all right, so, so he's going to win about 76% of the time from that point. Okay, so we got the math, 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 right mathematical results here, right? He's got the best hand, he won the hand, you know, because he's going to win 76% of the time. Okay, so now let's play it the other way. So now you've come to this seminar, right? So you raise with the ace jack of spades, right? The two fives calls you now. The board comes king of hearts, nine of hearts, six of diamonds. Now you bet, right? You got the lead. You bet. What does the two fives do? They fold. The board's king of hearts, nine of hearts, six of diamonds. I mean, they might try to bluff you, but we're not worried about that. He folds, right? But wait a minute. He had the best hand. His hand was going to win 76% of the time. The, but the issue is the cards are face down. It's what we talked about in the beginning. These cards are face down. He can't see your cards. So that is not what has determined who won here. What has determined who won was who took the lead before the flop. It is the most important thing you can remember, okay? Well, actually, it's the third most important thing you can remember. Okay. Um, so, the moral of the story is, raising buys you information, it narrows the field, and it gets you to take the lead. So, if you're wondering when you should raise and when you shouldn't, it's a very simple thing to understand. If I raise, will those things happen? Now, let me ask you a question. If you raise in a game where the players are very loose, and when you open the pot, you get four callers. Are those things happening? No, right? Because if four people are calling you, are they particularly giving you any good information about their hand? No. Are you narrowing the field? No. You don't have the lead because in a multi-way pot, the lead doesn't apply because now somebody has caught the board, right? So uh, you can't use it. Right. So if you're in a like, really loose, weird game where when you raise, these things don't happen, do you think raising is a particularly good strategy? No. But most of the games you play in, most of them, like 80% of them, this is probably a decent thing to be doing, right? Because if you raise, you'll probably get down to one or two players. You're looking for one, zero, one, or two. That's your goal in life, okay? So you have to go out and decide, like, well, maybe you're in a one and two dollar no limit game with people, it's late at night in Vegas on a Saturday night, and they're all kind of playing every pot, right? So you know if you're in that game, I don't. So you can decide whether raising is a good tool in that game. And what people say to me all the time is they come up to me, they go, how do you deal with these stupid games where, you know, people don't know how to play poker and they're always calling you and it's so stupid because it's not poker. 
and I say, of course it's poker, you're the one playing badly. Because you think, because you've read it in books, and you've seen it on TV, that in order to be a good poker player, you're supposed to raise and you're supposed to bluff all the time, right? But that's not true. To be a good poker player, you're supposed to raise when it's useful, and you're supposed to bluff when you can. And in a really loose game, none of those things is true, so you should just change your strategy to adjust to the game. Because the idea when people come up to me and they say, oh, I never play in those stupid games with idiots, because, ah, oh, you can't raise and you can't, it's so stupid, it's not poker. I say, really? Because I'd rather play with idiots than good players. <laughs> Call me stupid. But it's a matter of not being rigid in your thinking and not being rule-driven in your thinking and actually learning to navigate and problem-solve these situations for yourself. That's what's in the book. Okay, so tomorrow, you should come back for that if you'd like. That's that.